but uh, as I say, hopefully that won't be happening. Right, so if I can move to um, the first item of the agenda tonight, which is minutes of the last meeting which was held on the 6th of September. They've laid on the table for half an hour before the meeting. Are you content that I sign these minutes? Agreed. Thank you, colleagues. I'll sign them at the end of this meeting. Can I have any po apologies for absence? None, Chairman. Thank you. Any declarations of interest? No? Can I move to item four, which is questions from members of the public? I believe we have one from uh, Mr. Michael Hyman. Mr. Hyman, would you like to read your question out or would you like me to? Yes? If you'd like to come forward and read your question out, that's absolutely fine. Well, we'll need to, if, if, you, if you'd like to speak, then you're um, recorded on the webcast. Thank you. Thank you, Leader. As you may be aware, implementing consent for Farnham's Brightwells Memorial Hall project was confirmed on the 9th of September by issue of the decision notice. You may also be aware that this is an environmental impact assessment project, the Town and Country Planning Regulations 2011, governing which require, and I quote from part one, paragraph three, four, the relevant planning authority or the Secretary of State or an inspector shall not grant planning permission or subsequent consent pursuant to an application to which this regulation applies unless they have first taken the environmental information into consideration and they shall state in their decision that they have done so. Also, Schedule 4 of the regulations details the information for inclusion in environmental statements, including, and I quote again from part one, para six and part two, para five, a non-technical summary of the information provided. <clears throat> this is to ensure that not only the planning officers, but also the public and non-technical councillors can assess the likely consequences of the development on a fully informed basis before permission is granted. However, you may not be aware that a non-technical summary for the whole project has not been provided and that the portfolio holder for the project has confirmed that further assessment of the traffic impacts is required, but that this will not be carried out until after work on the project has commenced. Will you please confirm that the implementing consent for this project is therefore in breach of the planning regulations. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hyman. So you have before you um, an, an, an answer to this question, but I will read it out. So again, that's for the record and um, can, can also be um, seen on the webcast. <coughs> The East Street Brightwells project is authorised by the extant planning permission under WA 2016-0268 and prior to that the permission under WA 2012-0912 and WA 2008-0279. The original environmental statement submitted as part of the 2008 permission and the addendum submitted in 2012 and 2016 were comprehensively assessed and considered to satisfactorily address the environmental impacts of the scheme. The recent decision to grant permission under section 73 for minor material amendments under WA 
included an EIA addendum that updated the original EIA. Although a non-technical summary was not submitted with that application, it was provided in summary form. Therefore, I can confirm that the extant permission has been lawfully granted and that there is no breach of the EIA regulations. Mr. Hyman, I'll ensure you've got a written response as well so that you've got this by copy. All right. Thank you. Do you think we could have some lights on up here, please? Thank you. Right. Moving to item five, which is the executive forward program on um, pages 11 to 14, colleagues. Any comments that you wish to make? Thank you. I'll take that as noted and agreed. Thank you. Thank you for the lights as well. <laughs> Right, that's better. So moving to item six, and that's the local government funding update and four-year grant settlement. The report's on pages 15 to 24, and we have a speaker uh, to speak to that item, Councillor Hyman, given notice to speak. Thank, Thank you. you. May I remind you, you've got four minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Leader. Um, I am virtually in agreement with the Council's, uh, with your executive's position on this. I think um, uh, the, uh, what's been put in front of us by the government is quite iniquitous, um, asking for a contradictory decision. As you see, we are um, asked to agree, but also to object at the same time. And, uh, and that's what the recommendation says we should do. We're putting a very difficult situation. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. This year's um, allowance of 765,000 is safe. Uh, it's in thousands, not in millions, as the papers say. I'm sure everyone's aware of that. Um, this is, therefore, relatively small beer compared to some of the items that the executive were putting forward in terms of spending to the, the, the council. But nevertheless, it's important. Um, I certainly don't like what the government is doing because we shouldn't be making this decision or you shouldn't be making this decision in the absence of the uh, funding arrangements for um, the uh, new homes bonus and the business rates, which we're not allowed to know yet. So it's an almost impossible decision for you to make. I'm very much on your side in that. It's very difficult. I think the word which you probably wouldn't like to use for your government, but I'm perfectly free to use, would be blackmail because that's what this looks like to me. The government is saying you take this or things are going to be worse. And it's not the way the government should be making us uh, take our decisions. Uh, I do see a couple of problems with this, though. Firstly, paragraph 6 on page 17, if I can refer you to that, it tells you that uh, um, the government has announced it intends to move to a position where all business rates will be retained by the local government sector. And that contradicts the third paragraph of um, page 19, annex 2, just one page later, which says uh, the government's committed to local government retaining 100% of its business rate revenues by the end of this parliament. It will give you control over additional 13 billion of tax cumulatively the, uh, the, the, the councils uh, take, well, we're, we're not going to be given all of that money. Um, it's, it's, uh, I, I don't think that's very clear. Um, paragraph 5 also tells us that the um, efficiency plan must be open and transparent about the benefits accepting the four-year settlement will bring to both the council and the community, and I've been through that. And quite frankly, I can't see anywhere where it is open and transparent about the benefits that this is going to bring, certainly to the community. I, perhaps someone would like to explain where, it's, where it does do that. But more importantly, and finally, um, recommendation three says that the efficiency plan has to be in by 14th of October. Uh, the top of page 20 tells us it's got to be in by the evening of that Friday, the 14th of October, yet your recommendation says 
that this is going to be taken by council on the 18th and I don't think necessarily they can do that retrospectively perhaps you'd like to clarify that I do see a problem there with um, how can recommendation 3 um, be, be uh, granted this evening without some sort of um, old slight alteration you'd like to consider perhaps uh, in view of that this has to be in by the 14th but you're asking council to agree it on the 18th Leader, that's all. Thank you very much for your time. Um, Mr. Hyman, uh, Councillor Hyman, sorry, thank you. Um, Councillor Hall may wish to speak to some of the items, um, but yes, the dates, we are aware of, of those dates. Um, I know it appears they contradict each other, um, but we have actually uh, been in touch with the authorities, with uh, DCLG, and we are assured that, obviously, for our committee process, you're quite right, it does have to come before council. We've been assured that um, it, it's fine to submit it literally the, the following day after, after count, that council meeting. So yes, we are aware of that and we have actually got assurances from them because obviously we don't want to chip ourselves up on that either. Um, I'll let Councillor Hall Hall, answer your other questions and then we'll, we can come back again if necessary. Councillor Hall. Thank you, Leader. Yeah, you took the words out of my mouth with the uh, dates clarification. I mean, the purpose of the grant settlement is to remove the risks uh, which are associated with the central government grant uh, and changing the amounts of the revenue support grant. Uh, members, as you have noticed, Councillor Hyman, uh, will notice the final amount in 2019 and 2020 is negative. Uh, we're only going to go into this agreement uh, by requesting that central government uh, reconsider the negative grant in 2019-2020. Uh, so you have uh, three recommendations, members. Councillor Hall, thank you. I, th I think um, uh, to, to the point that Councillor Hyman makes, and, and we all recognise um, local government, and that includes Waverley, um, as a local authority, we're in a really difficult position here and um, what we're keen to do is, is try and have some form of certainty, um, but we have to continue to lobby um, and put our case because uh, obviously um, it is really, really concerning for us. But um, thank you for your, uh, your comments. Any other comments, Executive? Are we agreed? that we take recommendations one, two, and three on item six. Three. Thank you. Moving on to item seven, Councillor Hall, um, your show again, Treasury Management Activity. Thank you, Leader. I think I'm going to be doing a lot of this tonight. Uh, on this item, I've not really got much to report. Uh, we're approximately 10 basis points ahead of the target, uh, 0.1 of a percent. However, there's a footnote for members and those interested. Uh, that with the current, current levels of interest rates, less the current inflation rates, we are effectively in a uh, negative real interest rate environment. Um, now, this is going to have no impact on the budget for this year, but it obviously is a main driver for the Council to be out seeking uh, income-generating activities and to look for ways to make efficiencies and more money in the future. So, I mean, you're asked to note and endorse the current approach but uh, there is a small warning there that if rates continue to stay low you know the council will have to look at raising further revenues thank you leader councillor hall thank you executive anyone else like to comment on that no right we've got one recommendation under item seven is that agreed, agreed. thank you Item 8, which is funding schemes for the voluntary sector organisations, and I have one speaker on that, Councillor Hyman. Thank you, Leader, and um, briefly, I, I realise that part of this perhaps would be uh, better to be uh, um, addressed at uh, ONS, but uh, uh, the opportunity wasn't entirely, entirely there. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong, my understanding is that SLAs um, don't give an entirely a three-year guarantee because within the agreements they are it is uh, subject to government funding um, there's, there's a clause in there um, that's what I've been told but I, I haven't had the opportunity to check that for myself so correct me if I'm wrong and um, 
it does a, a, appear to me as though we are, we are trying to get rid of the voluntary sector grants to some extent, those which won't agree to a, a, an SLA or, or don't really fit into the system. I'm particularly concerned with the effect on challenges. We've got seven and a half thousand pounds that uh, used to be called disability challenges, and the challenges are, uh, appear to be losing, as do one or two others, which I think might include the um, a rural life centre, a, a, a couple of grand. And uh, although I note from paragraph 12 that uh, Councillor Ramsdale, chairman, as chairman of Community Overview and Scrutiny, um, did make a very good point um, in, in respect of keeping the money, it's not entirely clear how this is being um, put forward. I know that these organisations, such as Challengers, do need to know their fate well in advance. So I'd like to know, in terms of whether this is a possible saving, which is um, recommendation three on page 39, uh, at the top of the page it, it says possible reinstatement um, mm -hmm. of, of, of the grants. Uh, when will that decision be made on, on behalf of the organisations affected? Obviously they'd like to know as soon as possible. Um, I'm wondering when will the decision be made by the council, it looks like a little bit of a fudge in this paperwork, uh, in, in respect of when um, they will know their fate or whether they can continue with that funding, um, Leader. That's, um, I, th I think, just about everything, really, that I wanted to point out. Could I ask that? Thank you. Thank you, um, Councillor Hyman. I'll ask uh, Councillor Bolton, and then I see also Councillor Adams wants to come in, and then if you've not answered everything, let's, let's see what else we can then add to it to uh, reassure Councillor Hyman. Thank you, Chairman. The Council is hugely supportive of the voluntary organisations in the borough and is pleased to maintain, have maintained the overall budget at the same level since 2012-13, despite having to make significant savings on other services. Sure. We provide a large amount of money, about three quarters of a million pounds, to support organisations in our borough. <coughs> there are as Councillor Hyman has suggested, there are a number of types of grant, three types of grant. Service level agreements, familiarly known as SLAs. Voluntary Commission Partnership Scheme, which we work with Surrey County Council. And a Community Grant Scheme. We propose here that the third be suspended and recipients transferred to SLAs for a period of one year to help them into the SLA followed by joining the standard three-year process. We have confirmed with Surrey County Council that any money transferred to the Commission, the second alternative, could be aimed at children and young people. Indeed, this is exactly what Guildford Borough Council do. Our proposals have the added benefit of reducing the administrative workload, which can be significant, and saving staff time. I commend the proposals to the executive. Thank you, Chair. Count Councillor Bolton, thank you. Um, Councillor Adams, you wanted to add something to that? Thank you, Chairman. Yes, I just wanted to comment on the uh, uh, point made about the Rural Life Centre, because it's in my ward. Um, I have regular discussions with the Rural Life Centre and in fact um, quite a number of the uh, organisations which had individual grants uh, were made aware that these grants were for start-up purposes and that um, they were expected to gradually support themselves. Uh, this is certainly the attitude taken by the Rural Life Centre and uh, they're well aware that um, their grant may gradually fade away. Um, they've taken extensive action to um, replace that money by uh, enhancing their uh, status as an um, exhibition, if you like, or a um, museum site. Um, and uh, that, I think, has been very successful. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Adams. Anyone else wish to speak to that? Councillor Dinas. Just a very quick point. Uh, it does take a lot of time to organise these grants and the administration. Um, I've seen the paperwork it has generated to read through, um, and I think any process or changes which will make this more efficient has to be supported. 
Thank you. Councillor Edwards. Uh, thank you, Leader. Yes, um, I've been involved with grants for uh, since I've been on the council in 2007, and uh, I've been in the process of the, well, along with my fellow councillor, Councillor King, in setting up the SLAs and monitoring the performance of the um, the receivers of the SLAs, and it is very, very much appreciated, and it works. We get good value for money. We see um, them producing excellent results, and I think what we're doing at the present time uh, is really fantastic, and we should support everything we can to do with this particular recommendation. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Um, I think it's really important that we were, as, as we've, we've all intimated and, and what we're, we realise that what we're trying to achieve here is, is the right balance. Um, for a number of organisations, um, we certainly have found, and I know a lot of them um, after some in initial um, sort of uh, teething problems perhaps for them, they've actually found working on an SLA to be hugely beneficial. Um, and there are then no surprises. Each side, each party knows exactly what's expected of them, um, what the boundaries are, uh, and there are clear measures then in place so that everyone you know, understands what, what is happening going forward. I would also say that, that there are some organisations where um, maybe they are, are not so suitable and suited to an SLA. Um, but that's why we've got this sort of transition. And we also have an emergency funding pot as well. That emergency funding provision will remain in place. And what we also have are a number of very experienced, dedicated officers um, who work within our, our community services team and um, in, in a number of other areas, but very experienced officers who are able to signpost and work with a lot of these vol voluntary organisations to really assist them in finding other sources of funding, finding grants, and making sure that there's a lot of collaborative working. And we really do benefit from some very, very strong relationships out there in the voluntary sector. And we have absolutely no wish, just to reassure you, Councillor Hyman, no wish to in any way jeopardise that. Um, but as I say, it is important that we find the right balance. And um, it is important that um, you know, we, we continually review our processes to make sure that we're all working in the most efficient way uh, and to make the best use of the money that we have. Um, it's some sort of three quarters of a million pounds in grants. That's a significant sum of money when as a council we're very financially challenged. And again, I think that in itself demonstrates our commitment to the most important sector, the voluntary sector. And we really do, we recognise that and we're demonstrating that. I can see Councillor Edwards gesturing. Councillor Edwards, would you like to come back? Uh, yeah, just a quick one. I, I, I apologise for not mentioning the, uh, the expertise of the officers, but I'd like to uh, propose a vote of thanks to those officers because they do, they've done an excellent work, and we've moved on tremendously in the last five or six years in the work we do and the value that we get from ratepayers' money. And uh, this is all down to the, uh, the whole team there, I mean, from the bottom to the top, and uh, well done to them. Thank you, Councillor Edwards. I know I, um, Councillor King and yourself have s sat on the, the panel for a number of years, and I, I sat for a few years myself, and um, the amount of work that goes into it over a period of several months each year, pulling everything together and, and working with the various organisations is absolutely huge. So yes, I think we'd all, all echo that. So on that note, can I move to the recommendations to that item? And so there's, there are four recommendations from on page three and one moving on to page four. 
Are those agreed? Amen. Thank you. Uh, moving to item nine, Councillor Hall again. Thank you very much, Leda, once again. Um, okay, item nine is debt write-offs. Uh, we have total write-offs of about 166,000. Um, looking into the details in the report, this is mainly due to four companies which have liquidated an individual voluntary arrangement and a bankruptcy. Um, so the recommendation is to approve the write-offs in accordance with the Council's financial regulations. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor Hall. Um, we have one recommendation under item nine. Is that agreed, colleagues? Agreed. Thank you. Item 10, which is water charges, and that relates to Waverley Borough Council and Thames Water. The report is on pages 47 to 50, and Councillor Williamson, you'd like to speak to that item. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, Leader. Um, on my initial skim through the report, I, uh, I did think that there was an issue related to uh, informing the, uh, the residents, the tenants. Uh, however, uh, on reading the report thoroughly, as I did this afternoon, I realised that it was covered extremely well. Uh, and in fact, I, uh, um, I, I'm sure the, uh, the residents, the tenants, uh, will uh, not have any issues at all with it, and I think it's a very good report to be commended. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think what I, what I would like to say on, on this, and I, I won't say too much, is that um, when we, as a, a leadership and an executive, became aware of this item, um, we felt it of the utmost importance that um, we communicated that, um, and, as you say, um, we've also made sure that we've written to, to the tenants involved as well. Um, I don't think there's very much more at this stage we really want to say, but Councillor King as portfolio holder, would you like to follow up on anything further? Yes, thank you very much indeed, Leader. Yes, I would confirm that all the tenants who have unmetered water um, supplied by Thames Water have been informed. Uh, this is an initial heads up of where we're at. Um, this relates to, to a contract that's signed way back in 2003 uh, under a different administration. It only affects the Thames water um, people in the borough. It does not affect, as far as we know at the moment, it doesn't affect um, South East, Southeastern water or whatever it's called, Come now, um, which I know affects part of my ward in Hazelmere. Um, I can't make, as you say, I can't really make many more, any comment. Legal are, are handling this, and along with finance, who are, are looking at what the implication, financial implications may well be. It could be up to as much as about £400,000. Uh, the tenants will have to be consulted uh, before we make any arrangements or plans, so I can't predetermine the outcome of, of that consultation but we will keep everyone informed. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor King. I understand some 70 councils, approximately 70, I think, are affected. So uh, that's, that's sort of uh, quite a significant number. Uh, Councillor Edwards, you wish to speak? Uh, thank you, uh, Leader. I'd just like to pay a tribute here again to uh, Everybody involved in this has been handled excellently right from the very start. It's clear, and we couldn't have done more for our tenants. And I, I, you know, I commend the portfolio holder and the officers uh, for a, a job well done. Thank you very much. Thank you. On item 10, there are five recommendations. Executive, are those agreed? Agreed. Good. On Item 11, which is the General Fund Property Investment Strategy. The report is on pages 51 to 56. And Councillor Hyman, I believe you wish to speak to that item. Thank you again, Leader. Um, yes, I, I think we all understand the, the government's drive for self-sufficiency. 
or, or at least the government's trying for, for us to give our excess money to other councils who can't be self-sufficient, perhaps. Um, but um, we do need to try and maximise our, um, our income. But uh, a caveat, residents might well question whether it is wise to become a property investor when we are in a market bubble, uh, which is supported by negative interest rates, quantitative easing, etc. I do urge great care and... Um, uh, that's, that's as an overview. Um, I would particularly um, like to know at some point, not this evening obviously, we did do something like this. It was actually to do with the house building and the government changed the law to allow us to do it. We, Waverley did some eight and nine, ten years ago, start off a housing board, um, which was a limited company, spent quite a lot of money on legal advice and all the rest of it, and um, it was recently abolished because obviously it had no future. It was never used. Um, I don't know what the costs were. It would be nice to know what, what that did cost us for starting it up and getting rid of it without doing anything. I hope we're not going to repeat that. Um, do we actually have any figures for the likely or projected profits, um, particularly in terms of the, the cost of the consultants, the advisors, and the staffing of this against the projected additional income? Because I think that's what um, we would want to look at. Um, the legal advice costs m may well make this unviable because everything, it's, th 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 this, this is tightly controlled by the law as to what councils can do in this respect. As the report quite rightly says, there's a lot of hard work gone into this report. It's a very good report. Um, but I, I'm, I'm concerned that this may be something where it's difficult for us to make more money than, than the pittance that we get uh, at the moment out of the bank or other investments. Uh, but my main concern is paragraph 11, the decisions to be made by the executive, that's uh, reiterated in recommendation 6. These are m up to a million pound decisions uh, and we're asking council, you're asking council here, um, to allow executive to make those decisions without, possibly without any scrutiny or re recourse to council. I thought the council could only make decisions up to £20,000 without, uh, sorry, the executive could only make decisions up to £20,000 without going to council and this seems to be rather volt fuss and we, it would worry me if, uh, if there were million pound decisions going through without scrutiny and without uh, the, the rest of the council having any sort of real input into them. So can you confirm this is a, a, a complete change of the council's position in respect of uh, what the executive can do in as much as you are asking for consent, the council's consent to uh, make one million pound decisions uh, without recourse to the council? Thank you, leader. Thank you, Councillor Hyman. Um, Councillor Hall, do you want to come back first and then I'll take the rest of the questions? Just give, perhaps give uh, a little bit more information to Councillor Hyman. Uh, yes, certainly. Councillor Hyman, thank you for your question. Um, I mean, you raise an important point about market timing with regard to the property market. I mean, any properties which are taken either commercially or domestically or to be built and sold or to be built and let, will obviously have to take into account the capital value versus the yield you expect to get from them. Now, obviously, when you have a housing market as you have currently, where you've got disproportionately high values and disproportionately low yields, obviously, you've got to choose those opportunities very carefully based off robust financial analysis. Um, and that is obviously something that will be the cornerstone of any investment we make. Uh, but you do make a good point. We're in a high value and low yield environment. So uh, we will have to be very careful when we choose those opportunities. Uh, your second question, I believe, was, do, are there as yet any projections for profit? Well, no, there, there are no defined profit projections as yet. This is because we are still in the build phase. And what will happen is when the authorities are put together for the council to form this, is that there'll be a modus operandi put together in terms of what we expect to do, how many projects we expect, and over the next five years, roughly what sort of income we would expect to target. Um, this is crucially important, as you, uh, as you already recognise, because the income which we make in these investments which are made around the borough goes directly towards our residents and to supplying the services and ensuring that Waverley can continue to do that. So uh, there will be projections which we produce for income and for expenditure for the uh, investment strategy. However, as it is just purely in its formation, the minutiae, the detail is not yet uh, released, but I can assure you it will be uh, shortly when it's put together. Um, 
And to answer your final question, yeah, this, this is indeed a strategic change. Uh, the council, as you know from the uh, reduction in the revenue support grants which are going on, in order to provide the same level of services, has to look to opportunities to provide income in order to provide services. It's, it's common sense. This is a tra change of strategy away from taking reduced income and actually going out there and making sure the council has revenue streams to serve our residents with. So, yes, it is a change of strategy. I think I covered all three, Leader. Thank you. Um, in terms of um, regulation and governance, um, Councillor Hyman, I, I really would like to assure you that um, this will be very strictly regulated. As, to your point, um, as a local authority, um, we, we have to be very mindful of that. Um, and both Mr. Clark, um, our um, finance director, and Mr. Wenham, executive director are, are very aware of that and will be working very closely um, with, with us on that. Um, Mr Wenham, would you like to speak at all to this item for Mr Hyman? Thank you, thank you Leader. Just a point of clarification. Um, Councillor Hyman mentioned values of 20,000. That, that's a very limited figure in the budget and that's about supplementary estimates that can be agreed by the executive. There's another figure of 50,000, which is for violence, but they are very marginal aspects of the council's business. And the council does, in fact, delegate multi million pound budgets to the executives per view um, for a whole range of things, housing schemes, etc. And they come regularly here, and you'll see them in future meetings. Um, so this, this is no difference if the council agrees to the principle of allocating money to the executive. It's exactly the same. It's subject to full scrutiny as any other capital expenditure. And all decisions come before the executive and will be either in open or if they are commercially sensitive in exempt, which all members will be able to see and they will feed through to the council in a normal way. So for full transparency, Leader. Thank you. Thank you for, for that clarity. I hope you found that helpful, Councillor Hyman. Councillor Martin and then Councillor Bolton. Uh, thank you. I, I think this is a really exciting opportunity for this council. Um, I, I also think it's worth noting that, that we're not at the bleeding edge here. This, this is not something that, that uh, has never been seen before. Um, in fact, this works very well at uh, Surrey County Council, for instance, who um, have uh, invested themselves locally uh, in Waverley in the, in the Brightwells uh, development and, um, and, and will reap the benefits um, of that in, in the future, um, as indeed we will. Um, it is an investment that, that, that we're making and we also have um, ongoing revenue, and I think that's really key, that, that we keep ongoing revenue streams um, wherever possible open to us because as we've seen earlier on uh, government um, grants to this council are uh, ever diminishing and may well turn into punitive punishments uh, to us uh, and therefore we need to, uh, to to find ways to to balance our books so uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to the to the startup of this board thank you councillor Bolton uh, thank you chairman uh, Councillor Martin may have anticipated me slightly. <laughs> I'm the portfolio holder responsible for economic development, and of course I welcome the creation of the board. I would just briefly like to say that the LGA has published a survey of councils and their plans to raise income, and of course we will use this information to guide us in our work. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bolton. Yes, I know that... Um we and also um, senior uh, officers have been uh, already liaising with the LGA and also um, looking and, and talking to um, some of the other councils who are, who are working in a similar way. So um, we can certainly um, uh, search and, and reapply in, in, a, in a number of ways to ensure that uh, we move forward. And um, this, this does indeed generate income and allow us to um, continue to deliver the services we want for our residents. Um, as Councillor Hall and several other colleagues have said, this is about income generation and uh, that's absolutely crucial for this council. Colleagues, there are six recommendations under item 11. Are those agreed? Agreed. Thank you. 
item 12, which is the appropriation of land at Bourne Recreation Ground. Um, Councillor Martin. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, this is, again, another very exciting uh, opportunity that um, has presented itself, really, to, to um, uh, the Bourne, um, the, the Bourne Recreation Ground. Uh, we've, uh, at a previous council meeting, we have uh, resolved the, our intention to appropriate land there. This is essentially the second stage um, of that appropriation. Um, the report is fairly self-explanatory, and I commend it to councillors. Colleagues, any comment or are the two recommendations agreed? Thank you. Uh, we move to item 13, which is the cultural strategy for Waverley, um, pages 69 to 132. I have Councillor Williamson to speak on that item. Thank you again, Leader. Um, I suppose I should apologise for not attending the, uh, the ONS meeting at which uh, this, was, uh, this was discussed. Um, but I, I did take time to, uh, to look at the, uh, the webcam uh, on, the, uh, on the meeting. But I'm, I'm, still, I'm still a bit lost on the... Uh, I mean, we, we have... We've engaged consultants to produce a 10-year um, cultural strategy document. Um, we're now proposing to have a, um, a cultural strategy action plan workshop. It just appears to me, uh, considering all the, uh, the concerns that were raised at ONS, um, which are recorded in the report, though they don't seem to have been actioned, um, it just appears to me that the sensible thing would have been to have had the workshop at the beginning to discuss the strategy and agree the strategy, and then the the, the, the actions, the objectives, uh, the, uh, the, the, the the targets would have come from that. It, it just seems as though we've put the cart before the horse. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Williamson. Councillor Els, would you like to speak? Yes, thank you, Leader. Um, well, the cultural strategy was presented to ONS uh, in its draft form, and may I point out that in the papers it does say phase two, but it actually was phase one, so um, that was a, 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 a typo, I think. Um, I, I actually don't agree at all that we should have had the workshop first because we need something to base the workshop on. Otherwise, everybody's going to be there for two weeks floundering about trying to decide what to discuss. So we had the, um, we had the consultant's report, and um, indeed, it is a long one. Um, I think that um, we gained a lot from it. I think that our officer who... Um, works on our cultural strategy, um, has gleaned a lot of information. It's given a good, broad indication of what actually is going on in the borough, which is what we needed to know. Um, we very much welcomed the comments and observations from Community ONS, um, and we're working to use those comments and observations to develop phase two of the cultural strategy so that it's ready to present again to ONS in January. That was always the plan. So hopefully this executive will agree to um, a workshop which is planned to take place in November. And again, the information gathered there, and that will be held with our partners and um, any interested members who um, were interested enough to make comments and suggestions from ONS will be invited to join us so that they can actually take an active part in the development of this. Um, so that, that will happen in November, hopefully, if this executive uh, agrees. And um, all that information will be used towards finalising the cultural strategy um, phase two in January. Um, the cultural strategy is um, going to be... Um, uh, written so that it runs alongside the corporate priorities and it has to also dovetail with our local plan because that is a requirement uh, that we have a cultural strategy in our borough 
that works well with the infrastructure and the facilities that we have in the borough. So, and also, um, we work with, uh, of course, we will be looking forward to working with the, with the SIL contributions um, towards um, improving our cultural uh, experience in Waverley. So, thank you very much. Thank you for that very comprehensive answer, Councillor Rails. Colleagues, would anyone else like to speak to that item? Councillor Bolton. Thank you, Chairman. I regard this as an excellent paper for the next 10 years. I have in the past been a director of a small publishing company which has received some funding from the Arts Council of England. Some councillors seem to object to this general and wide-ranging strategy. Some may wish for a more specialist document addressing a more limited agenda. I deprecate this approach. I want to congratulate the authors of the report. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bolton. Um, as Councillor Els said, I think, to sum up, that we, we now have the outline for and, and sort of a, a basic structure for, for the workshop. Um, I've no doubt, Councillor Williamson, that you will be attending. Um, we're very lucky in Waverley. I know when I was fortunate enough to have uh, responsibility uh, on two occasions for the cultural portfolio, um, it really was... Uh, an eye-opener because we have so much and such a wide and diverse culture um, in this borough and we really are very fortunate so um, I really would encourage uh, all members or as many as possible to attend those workshops I think you'll um, you'll get a lot from them as well and hopefully be able to give us a lot of feedback uh, to inform the uh, the final uh, version of the cultural strategy Thank you. And moving to the recommendations for that item, we've got three recommendations on pages six and moving on to page seven. Colleagues, are those agreed? Agreed. Thank you. We then move to item 14, which is the Dunsfold and Dunsfold Church Conservation Area Appraisals. Colleagues, the report is pages 133 to 196. It's quite a detailed report. And Councillor Williamson, you're speaking to that Thank item. You. Thank you, Leader. I hadn't realised I'd put my name down for quite so many. But um, basically, I just wanted to, to say what a good report it was. I mean, I, um, I don't know Dunsville particularly. I know the airport quite well. Um, um, but I, uh, I, I really, until I read the report, I didn't know the area and its history. Uh, so I found it very, very informative. But I would make one, and, and I think that these conservation reports are superb um, you know, and, and should form the backbone of the bird. But I would make a, a general point and plea, really, that uh, these reports are not just put on a shelf. Um, they're actually used and referred to by not only people who you use as a subcontractor, but by Waverley, by the council itself. Uh, and it makes decisions based on the content of these reports. Thank you. Councillor Williamson, thank you. Councillor Adams, I'm sure you'd like to come back on that point. First, I'd like to turn on my microphone. Uh, then, I'd like to say... <laughs> second that. <laughs> thank you to Councillor Williamson. Um, <laughs> I've said in the past um, that on many of these reports um, how good they are, and I agree with you. This is um, yet another excellent report from the team uh, in the planning department that look into conservation areas. Um, <coughs> as the leader said, it runs from page 133 to 197. So I won't cover a lot of the report, even though it is well worth reading. Um, <coughs> But this is an, uh, an appraisal and proposed management plan. The management plan, obviously, is the guidance of things that should be done in the future. Um, <coughs> and that's just on pages 139 to 167 for Dunsfold, which is actually not part of the airport. The airport, as I'm regularly told, is in Allfold. Um, <coughs> anyway, Dunsfold has clearly had an interesting history from an initial clearing in the forest, 
through developing ironworks and then prospering by the way of the Way, oh, way and Aran Canal, and now a settled Surrey country village with period properties ranging from 1254 to the present day. Uh, the obligation to carry out proposals is supported by legislation and the latest English Heritage Guidelines. Uh, each CA has, they identify the character and qualities which should pres be preserved and enhanced. The changes proposed to the conservation area around the common are listed on pages 157 to 158. And the outline management plan starts on page 159. Uh, there is a second part, obviously, to this report, which covers Dunsfold Church Conservation Aerial Appraisal. And this, uh, the, the, the CA here consists of a small compact area around the church, surrounding, uh, with its surrounding dwellings, if I can get this, not skipping too many lines at the same time. Um, sorry for the delay. Uh, yep. <laughs> Uh, the church was built in 1270 to 1290 and it is little changed despite some alterations which started <laughs> which started in 1881. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> the proposal is to add two extensions to the CA, the cemetery and some land from the church close farm. It is suggested a field adjacent to the rectory be removed. In respect of both CAs, there is proposed a six-week consultation. Thank you, Councillor Adams. <laughs> right, colleagues, any questions? In terms of the uh, matter that was raised by Councillor Williamson, Mrs Sims, could you just clarify how these reports are used by your team? Because, obviously, you do use them and refer to them when planning applications and so forth come in. Would you just be so kind as to tell members a little bit about that? Thank you. Thank you, Leader. Yes, just to confirm, um, when um, properties that are subject to planning applications are submitted and we identify the planning constraints that um, are applicable to those properties, these conservation area appraisals are flagged up um, to the attention of the planning officers and they, on a routine basis, take them into account and the very good information in them and the um, advice in respect to the characters of the conservation areas in assessing relevant um, list planning application and listed building applications. Likewise, the historic buildings officers take them into account as well to inform their advice to us as planning officers as how to treat these applications. So we do routinely use them. Thank you, Leader. Thank you very much. Colleagues, I'm presuming that we've covered this in detail. There is one recommendation. Is that agreed? agreed? We now move to item 15. And I have no speakers on that, but I presume, Councillor Adams, it is the local plan. Do you wish to speak uh, uh, to uh, that item? Uh, yes, I will, but I'll... Briefly? <laughs> okay. I'll, uh... Uh, this is, is down to my colleague on my right, obviously, because he's the money man. Um, but this uh, sum is, uh, is required to bring local plan part two um, in line with uh, the requirements, really, of many of the villages and some towns in their neighbourhood plans. Uh, a local plan part two uh, helps... Uh, construct those neighbourhood plans. It helps provide the background for those neighbourhood plans and uh, produce also clarifies the detailed um, policies which are not included in local plan part one and which cover some of the safe policies from the old things, so the old um, 2002 local plan. So um, without this uh, proposed uh, uh, supplementary estimate, uh, it would drag on like the local plan part one dragged on. Thank you. Councillor Adams, <clears throat> thank you for summarising that. I think um, we're really fortunate. We've made a lot of progress um, with our local plan yeah. and um, 
what we do want to do is make sure that now we're, we're really at a stage of um, finishing the, um, the review of, of soundness and um, final uh, responses from uh, stakeholders and interested parties on part one prior to submission that we really can get going with part two. So we have, just checking, we have three recommendations on page seven uh, relating to resourcing that and I would ask executive colleagues, are those agreed? agreed? Thank you. Moving to item 16, which is the proposal to strengthen the finance system support capacity. That is Councillor Hall again, but firstly we have Councillor Williamson to speak. Thank you, Leader. I definitely put my name down for, uh, for two minutes. I, I, I suppose anything that... Um, Strengthen, strengthens uh, fiscal proficiency. Um, if I understand, at the moment you're buying in, I understand the council's buying in um, this expertise from, uh, uh, from the system suppliers. Therefore, if you engage somebody, to, this would improve your, your business case, right? If, if, you, um, if you're buying that in, uh, and you're going to employ someone to undertake that task, then presumably there is an additional saving which is not shown in, uh, uh, in, your, in your case that you've put forwards. So I just throw that out. The, uh, the second point is, can you confirm that um, in due course you won't be requesting uh, additional uh, funding for the recruitment of whatever they were, the finance officer and the senior accountant, when you realise that you haven't got the people to do that. Thank you. Do you want to come back, Councillor Hall, and then um, uh, Mr Vickers, our Head of Finance, has also got some additional... Uh, do you want to come straight in, Mr Vickers, and perhaps clarify a few of those aspects for Councillor Williamson, please? Thank you. Thank you, Leader. The, um, so the issue about buying in capacity is there's always an element that we need to um, refer to the consultants because it's highly technical aspects of the system that we just wouldn't have in-house in terms of systems programming. Um, but the, the, the way it's been going is that um, we've, we've just recently um, had a member of staff um, leave and that was where the te technical knowledge was sitting. So this post is actually about replacing that and consolidating all of the technical systems within the finance remit so that we can, we can build really strong capacity in-house and not have to uh, rely on external support. Mr. Wenham wanted to just add, add something briefly to that further as well, just to clarify a little bit more for you. Leader, um, whilst um, system refreshes, we, we have used technical external advice, the ongoing maintenance of the system is provided and has always been provided by internal staff. But this is about making the internal staff resource more resilient with the, the most recent refresh. And, you know, just to to answer the question about are we going to come back and say we need these extra posts, no, it is an evolving picture and the nature of the business changes and this is responding to that new environment, Leader. Thank you, Mr Wenham. Hopefully that helps to clarify, but um, I can see you're looking a little bit sceptical. Um, Councillor Williamson, if you've got a further question or you want some more clarity, if you, if you would like to come back to me, out of the meeting and I'll get that for you so you've got the information. All right. Thank you. So on item 16, we have two recommendations. Colleagues, are those agreed? Agreed. Moving to item 17. It's either the Councillor Hall or the Councillor Williamson show. So um, it's the Lower Church Lane replacement doors and windows and Councillor Williamson, you wish to speak to that item? Uh, thanks for, again, Leader. 
I guess this almost refers to the earlier one which we were talking about in terms of the conservation area. This is an absolute conservation area. It's, ab it's near the church. It's the centre of uh, Farnham. It's, it's one of the most precious parts of Farnham. Uh, it's been part of the conservation area forever. Um, and yet, to my understanding from the emails that I've seen, um, we, and I mean Waverley Borough Council, uh, either directly or through its contractors, allowed plastic windows to be put in there, and we're now having to replace them, and that's what this planning permission is for. Um, I mean, it, there's, there's two fundamental points. One, the, uh, the, the report which we said shouldn't be on a shelf and everybody should be informed, clearly that wasn't the case. Uh, so there's an example of it, it not working. Uh, and the, the second point is, are we paying for this twice? I mean, has somebody made a mistake um, and then we're being tasked with having to replace it? Or are we challenging the, 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 the subcontractor who put it in there? Councillor Mrs King, would you like to respond? Yes, thank you very much indeed, Leader. Um, as it's fairly evident, I think, from the report, this is a straightforward application seeking, uh, per sorry, seeking permission for listed building consent to replace the windows and doors on, on these two properties. Mr. Williamson is absolutely right. Uh, approximately four years ago, our then contractor mistakenly fitted the wrong windows and doors. Unfortunately, that contractor has now gone into liquidation. So we have no comeback on them. Uh, we are in the process of seeking out a new contractor who is able to do this job uh, this is proving quite difficult because it involves two different types of uh, window construction, both metal and timber. But we have a very clear action plan in place to get this work done. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor King. Yes, uh, as I say, <clears throat> hopefully lessons have been learned by all concerned so that... Um, I'm afraid you can't come back, Councillor Williamson, but again, if you want to have a one-to-one -one with Mrs King and she can um, clarify in a little bit more detail, but um, rest assured, she uh, is very much now on the case with this one uh, because, to your point, yeah. Colleagues, there's one recommendation to that item. Is that agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Item 18, which is the submission of a planning application for Farnham Town Football Club. Um, really pleased to see um, Mr Morgan um, in the public gallery. Thank you for, very much for coming along this evening, Mr Morgan. Um, he's the community lead at Farnham Town Football Club. So um, very pleased to, uh, to see them and uh, that they're very supportive of this application. Um, I understand we have a speaker, Mr Hyman, you wish to speak on this item. Thank you. Uh, thank you again, Leader. I think it's probably the last one. Um, yes, good to see Mr Morgan. And um, I think everybody is um, uh, fully supportive, obviously, of the uh, Farnham Town Football Club having uh, changing room facilities. Uh, uh, my concern here, in, in, in fact, I'm shocked with this report um, uh, because uh, there are certain elements in here which, um, as far as I can tell, uh, are completely uh, at odds with the facts, the evidence and the law. Um, if we look at, under legal implications on page 207, it says that um, uh, these changing rooms, the new ones, were put in place on the basis that, of p permitted development as they were intended as temporary provision for the duration of the Memorial Hall refurbishment. Um, only and that's um, well if you look at the plans last year and, and a, an awful lot of press releases that uh, you leader made uh, a year or two ago um, that's not at all the case and uh, it also concludes in that paragraph that um, pl planning permission for the changing rooms are, um, uh, is required so to, it must be granted before the works at the memorial hall are concluded well that's entirely irregular this is EIA development uh, madam chairman it's uh, uh, madam leader it says at the top this is an enabling phase to deliver the project 
project. We all remember, I'm sure, from the Riverside development and um, the literal cover-up over there that uh, you cannot um, carry out enabling development without carrying out EIA in advance. This is an enabling development for the East Street scheme, six, uh, condition 63 of the consent which was issued 0268, you referred to it earlier. Um, was issued on September the 9th, that uh, tells us uh, that this is enabling development. In fact, this is enabling development for the enabling development, and it is EIA development. That was established by the Secretary of State, and it's established in law, and the Secretary of State told you that. So I've got a copy of his determination with regard to Riverside, and exactly the same applies, and our staff know that. I'm very, very disappointed with this. It looks as though this is an attempt to continue doing what you're doing without having EIA consent in place, um, to continue with the construction of the East Street project without planning permission, without a complete EIA, and without ever assessing or considering the impacts of Crest's ridiculous new road scheme and the resulting congestion on, the, on our town. Uh, this is a major problem, Madam Chairman. I would suggest... Has this anything to do with um, the particular topic? which I believe is the Memorial Hall and nothing to do with East Street or Brightwells. Thank yes. you, Councillor Bolton. I was trying to give Councillor Hyman a little bit of leeway, given that he's still quite a new councillor here. But I think that you've made your point, Councillor Hyman, and we really are here to discuss a planning application for Farnham Town Football Club. So... Can I ask you to, to now close the item and <clears throat> Councillor Dinas, as portfolio holder, would you like to speak to the item? Thank you. Madam Chair, may I finish my time? I have a constitutional right, I think, to that. Uh, the Secretary of State did decide I was right and the Council was wrong all over Riverside and this is the same situation, Madam Leader. You, Councillor Hyman, you can have the rest of your time, but you need to stick to the agenda item, which is Farnham Town Football Club and the planning permission. Thank you. That's exactly what I was doing, Madam Chairman. This is EIA development because this is, as the item says, enabling development for the Memorial Hall. The Memorial Hall is enabling development for East Street. It requires EIA, so I'm requesting that you consider and ask perhaps uh, your officers uh, whether the correct thing to do is for you to um, change the change your uh, recommendation here um, in view of the Riverside case and, uh, and, and the situation uh, at the Memorial Point Hall. of order, please, Chairman. I think you've explained it very well. Uh, it is about uh, the Farnham Town Football Club and, you know, we bring in Uncle Tom Cobbley and all here, so can we just stick to the point, please? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would ask, in closing, that uh, you consider and ask your staff whether it is appropriate to change the recommendation so that it says officers are authorised to submit the required EIA application for works to the Memorial Hall and relocation of Farnham Town Football Club changing rooms and suspend the works on site immediately until necessary consents and appropriation have been obtained. I believe that is the correct process, Leader. Right if you get confirmation of that. Thank you. Councillor Hyman, thank you. Um, can I ask Mrs Sims and Mr Bainbridge as for some advice, please? Perhaps you'd like to respond to Councillor Hyman from a legal and planning perspective. I think it would be better if we took this and away and had a look at it and gave you an answer outside of the meeting, gave the executive and Councillor Hyman and Councillor Williamson an answer outside of the meeting because I don't think it's something that Mrs Sims and I can answer here and now for a three and a half minute question at the top of this agenda. I think we're happy to we're happy to give it provide an answer, but it'll be it needs to be detailed and we need to be outside of this meeting. But but that does not alter these recommendations does it and nor does it need to no it doesn't fine in that case councillor dinas this is your portfolio did you want to speak to the item and then we'll move to the recommendation i will indeed and uh, thank you to my colleague to my left for allowing someone else to speak tonight 
Um, as a result of refurbishment and extension of the Memorial Hall in Farnham, the changing rooms for the Farnham Town Football Club, which are located on the lower ground floor of the hall, had to be temporarily relocated whilst the works took place. The moving of the changing rooms did not require planning permission as they were a necessity as a result of the aforementioned works and therefore built under permitted development. The lower ground floor will be renovated as part of the refurbishment works. However, whilst the designs have become more crystallised, it became apparent that with the extension, the space created could house services with greater synergy. The decision was taken at the July Executive to locate Waverley Training Services into the lower ground floor, Waverley's apprenticeship training arm. It's therefore now prudent that the Council seeks to obtain planning permission for the temporary changing rooms to become permanent. The club is supportive of this as the changing rooms are superior to those previously offered in the Memorial Hall and in addition are in line with the recommendations of the Football Association for a Step 5 club, the level of Farnham Town Football Club. There is one recommendation which is shown on page 8 of your agenda and pages 208 of your papers. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor Dinas. Colleagues, I think the report and um, the conversation then and debate that's gone on before uh, speaks for itself. There is one recommendation to this item. Is that agreed? Agreed. agreed. Thank you. Item 19 is the performance management report, and that runs on pages 209 to 232. Now, the um, report itself has been considered by both the community and the corporate um, ONS committees, and you have their detailed comments within your papers. And as you will see, there have been a number of very positive performance indicators, um, many of which are showing uh, areas where the target has been exceeded, which is really good. Members of the ONS have given some very helpful feedback, and as a result of that, um, and we've, just, we've decided to look more closely at the actual format of the report, and some of the members of those ONS committees uh, will be coming in and uh, talking that through in more detail with uh, Mr Taylor, our Head of Policy and Governance. Um, and he will be working then with officers um, to review their comments so that we can ensure that we are actually getting the absolute maximum um, from these reports, and they really are as effective as they can be. Um, I think there are a couple of areas that I um, would comment on um, and would just ask for, for some clarity, um, and that's in relation to um, page 211 of the report um, on planning. Now, on item 10, paragraph 10 under planning on page 211, um, the, um, there is some discussion about the uh, planning service performance. Um, and one area that I would like, and I think a number of members would just like to understand ongoing in a little bit more detail, is where there have been requests to actually extend an application, so where extension to application time has been made, um, and uh, could we have a little bit more data in future, please, on, on that particular item? Uh, because I know that often is something that's raised by fellow councillors. So um, if I could ask Democratic Services and Mrs Sims to, to please make a note of that, that would be very helpful. And then um, to item 11, I note that um, performance on planning appeals, uh, again, has shown uh, an improvement and that in itself obviously is very, very good and very encouraging. Um, I attended, and I think a number of members did, and it's, it's noted in here, that there was mandatory training um, arranged for all planning committee members in August. And it then goes on to say that this was attended by around half the council members. 
I was here and it, there were there were probably only about half, half the members attending. It was in August, so of course that was holiday time as well. Can I just ask for some clarity again, please? Um, if those members who didn't attend, have they been offered another date? When will they be um, coming to another training session? Because that training session did cover a number of very crucial points. And if it's mandatory training, we do need to make sure, given that planning is a quasi-judicial process, that all our councillors are given the opportunity. And it may not be appropriate to have another evening session. It may be that we should have something during the day. But we do need to ensure that where we're having training sessions, all of our councillors are attending those, please. So if that could be followed up. Thank you. Um, but other than that, I have no further comments at this stage on this report. Councillor King, I see you have. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much indeed, Leader. I didn't want to let the opportunity go by. On page 230 at the top of the page, under H2, the average number of working days taken to relet our council homes. I would actually like to thank our officers and, believe it or not, our contractors, because they have worked incredibly hard during this year to try and get the length of time down. And I think that they should be congratulated. Thank you. Thank you. That is a, a marked improvement in performance. So, as you say, that's really encouraging. Colleagues, any other comments on this report? No? In that case, we've got two recommendations. Are they agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Um, we move to item 20, which is the appointment of a sustainability and transformation plan stakeholder reference group. Um, and uh, this is a, a new organisation being set up through um, the North West Surrey Clinical Commissioning Group. And um, we are recommending that Councillor Jenny Else, given that she has the part of her portfolio is, is health and wellbeing, be appointed as the Waverley representative on this plan stakeholder reference group. Colleagues, that's the recommendation to item 20. Is that agreed? Agreed. Thank you. Can I move to item 21, Executive Director's Actions? Mr Wenham. Leader, no actions on this category this month. Thank you. Thank you. Can I now move to item 22, the exclusion of the press and public? And can I ask colleagues that um, you consider the following recommendation? that pursuant to procedural rule 20 and in accordance with section 100A brackets 4 close brackets of the local government act 1972 that the press and public public be excluded from the meeting during consideration of the following items or item on the grounds that it is likely in view of the nature of the business to be transacted or the nature of the proceedings that if members of the public were present during these items, there would be disclosure to them of exempt information as defined by section 1001 of the Act of the description specified at the meeting in the revised part one of schedule 12A to the Local Government Act 19.